on the we're on the wing, we're racing. The start of the 40th edition of the Rolex Middle Sea Race. Valletta's Grand Harbour is a majestic sight on any day, but exceptional for the commencement of this offshore classic. The light wind start is congested and close fought. Exiting the harbour first has little impact on the race result, but the competitive spirit urges these crews ever forward. From the Maltese amateurs, to those expanding their sailing horizons, to those tackling the challenge with youthful enthusiasm, and the most focused of professional crews, this is the beginning of an enduring challenge. The circular 606 nautical mile course guides the fleet up the east coast of Sicily to the volcanic island of Stromboli, then to Favignana on the northwest of Sicily, then south round Pantelleria and Lampedusa before returning to Malta and the finish in Valletta. In 1982, Timmy Camilleri competed in his first Rolex Middle Sea race. The Maltese amateur has been on the winning yacht three times, including 2001, when Straight Dealer became the first and so far only Maltese boat to take line honours. As he takes part in his 26th race, the veteran is co-skippering Maltese entry X-Pact with one of the youngest ever sailors to participate. Richard, who's now 14, just came second in the uh, Optimus World Championships. Um, so he's, he's, you know, all out into sailing and racing. Um, but he also, since he was seven, has been around the boat expat. And, you know, he's always been longing to stay on board, you know. So now this time, uh, when he's finally 14 and he can join us, you know, he's, he's really, really keen. My dad has started 2012 was his first middle sea race and since then I wanted to take part. They had an age limit of 14 so I had to wait and I'm super excited to join the, the expect and as well skippering the boat. He's a, definitely a very good sailor so I think for him it's important to feel that he's a co-skipper himself that he might not have the experience to make some calls so I'll try and help him out and guide him wherever I can. Ahead of the race, a select group led by Rambler manages to capitalize on what wind is available and makes steady progress to the Strait of Messina. Passing through the strait with its unpredictable tides and currents is one of the race's key navigational challenges before the fleet breaks into the Tyrrhenian Sea. Lying in seventh place is Aragon. The Martin 72 is being campaigned by the Ocean Challenge Yacht Club from Poland. We passed uh, four boats. We are now on a big uh, drag race with uh, Lupa of the Sea to Stromboli. And uh, uh, these guys, we are fighting with them for the second place in our ISC one Only formed five years ago, this ambitious project aims to increase the profile of the sport into an underdeveloped territory. The aim of our club uh, through uh, participation in, su in such events like uh, Rolex Middle Sea Race is to educate uh, uh, Polish people uh, about how fantastic is uh, offshore sailing. The Tarnatsky family is central to sailing in Poland. Szemek's father, Bronislaw, was part of his country's groundbreaking entry in the 1973 Whitbread Round the World Race. For this enthusiastic crew of amateurs, the race is the latest round of an intensive induction to offshore competition that also included this year's Rolex Fastnet race. Sailing with our club is definitely life transforming for most of the guys uh, because they, they touch another world that they have never touched before. There's going to be a light wind start for the Middle Sea Race 2019. You can see here the core. Supporting the amateurs are a core of world class professionals, including navigator Miles Seddon, a Volvo Ocean Race veteran. So everybody can always add 1% to the speed by being in the right place. Sailing with the amateur crew is really quite interesting because. We're trying to get them to be involved and take ownership of things. And so we've tried to let them make the mistakes. And that's the way that they really work best, I think. We love to challenge ourselves. We want the fresh oxygen to circulate in our blood. We heard that the Rolex Middle Series is a challenging event, but we will be better sailors at the end here. 
Some 30 nautical miles ahead of the Polish team, Rambler, seeking a fifth victory in these waters, reaches the turning mark of Stromboli in the afternoon of day two. The American Maxi has more than a two-hour advantage over Wild Joe, followed by Arabas, and this year's Rolex Fastnet race winner, Wizard. A witness to every single Rolex Middle Sea race start, Fort St. Angelo is an irreplaceable symbol of Maltese identity in the very heart of the Grand Harbor. The embodiment of the nation's resistance during the Great Siege of Malta and the Second World War. This year marks the 40th anniversary of the Royal Navy leaving the fort and its cessation as an active military installation, a position it had held since medieval times. Fort St. Angelo has a great association with this event because this was the last military establishment which was vacated by the British forces in Malta. Therefore, uh, this was the last place which was controlled by a foreign power and it was the last remaining military site in, in Malta's long military history to finally be given back to the Maltese. It became to symbolize victory. And in fact, we nowadays think of St. Angelo as a building on the same terms as in other countries. For example, uh, the Colosseum it symbolizes Rome, the Eiffel Tower symbolizes Paris. Same way, Fort St. Angelo symbolizes Malta. Stromboli in early light is one of the race's memorable sights. In the morning of day three, Timmy Camilleri and Expac reached the active volcano just seconds apart from Elusive 2. The two Maltese entries once again joined in their customary, close-fought but friendly rivalry. Just over 30 minutes in arrears lies Courier Recommandé. Jerry Trontasso's JPK 1180 took a famous win here last year, and the French entry is looking to defend that title. After close to 48 hours of racing, Rambler approaches Sicily's most northwestern point, the only yacht to have escaped the clutches of the great wind shadow off the island's north coast as the rest of the fleet struggles. Rounding Favignana, the American Maxi picks up favorable winds, reaching 15 knots as she now leads on corrected time as well as line honors. Almost 200 miles behind, JYS Jan is exiting the Strait of Messina. We've just come through the Messina Strait. Uh, the wind has increased from earlier. Earlier there was almost nothing. We're in a big wind hole. We'd stopped moving. But we managed to cruise our way through it. And now we've got nice 12, 13 knots of breeze. JYS, or Jarhead Young Sailors Foundation, was created as a charity aimed at promoting the sport in Malta. The entry is headed by Nicky Henderson, the youngest ever skipper in the history of the Clipper Round the World race. The foundation wanted to run an all-girl team for quite a long time. You know, they really do struggle to get girls in to their sailing programs. So there's a lot more boys. So. Um, and definitely when they said, hey, we're running an all-female team, there was quite a lot more girls interested than would have been otherwise. Just because, you know, there are those jobs they maybe don't naturally fall into. Maybe they, you know, they feel like, you know, the boys are taller than them, so they'll be on the mast. And actually, with the all-girls idea, they do get a chance to, to do every job on the boat without feeling like they're hindering the team. And do you know what? It's also really fun. Like, they have a really good time. Down a little bit, you're just generally a little bit too high. Stand up, Millie, use your body. There you go. The crew includes five sailors under the age of 22 and came together just days before the race start. Yes, Tice, look at that, look how much you got in. I've never sailed on a yacht before and I really uh, love the learning process, sort of. We started out from scratch and I think now we're in a good level to actually race together. So they actually only all met each other two days ago, and it's like they've known each other for years. It's brilliant. I mean, there is a slight air of they don't quite know what they're getting themselves in for. They are slightly fearless, and that's the beauty of it. I think it's that bit of fear that turns into excitement eventually. I just love having that feeling where you're, not, you're unsure of what's about to hit you, and 
you know, you just have to expect the unexpected. In the battle for line honours, Rambler's lead is unassailable. Aragon lies over 17 hours behind, but the Polish team is involved in a tight tactical battle in IRC1 as she approaches Pantelleria. Yeah, we don't want to go too close here, we don't want to get greedy. Just keep down at this angle, this line through. We are here just approaching Pantelleria. Uh, we're just starting to get caught in the wind shadow of it, so um, we've got Aegea just ahead of us and Pendragon, I think. Uh, just a little further offshore and they've both parked up in the wind shadow. So we're just trying to cut the corner off a little bit, get as close to the island as we can. We've got to go through the wind shadow as well, but hopefully we'll just sneak through it a little quicker and cut some distance off. As the medium-sized boats round the northwestern tip of Sicily, the contenders for victory on corrected time are beginning to show themselves. Rambler retains the virtual lead, but the first of the Maltese yachts, Lee Satariano's all-new RT3, begins to threaten. While Renzo Grottesi's Club Swan 42 B Wild now lies second in IRC standings. Yachts that had seemed to be running out of steam now appear reinvigorated by the strong southerly filling the channel between Sicily and North Africa. None more so than two constant contenders for victory. Elusive too, the Podesta family's entry is a habitual challenger in this race, but never a winner. Could this be her year? Within touching distance, Courier Recommende. Could she make it back-to-back -back victories? At the head of the race, Rambler's dominance is absolute. By the time she passes Lampedusa, she holds a lead of over 170 miles over the next monohull. Arriving in Valletta in early light, after close to two days and 20 hours at sea, the American Maxi secures line honors for an unprecedented fifth time in a row. The win is so comprehensive, it gives George David's team an outside chance of taking victory on corrected time. This year could be corrected time, win in line honors. It'd be nice to bookend 12 years apart in different boats. Lots of things have happened in all of our lives since then. So I'm kind of hoping that we might actually pull this off. But we'll see. Past Lampedusa. Aragon's battle within her class continues. We are now going to enter reach uh, for Malta, final reach. Uh, we are fighting for the second place with Wild Joe. Uh, it looks like these guys are much more quicker on the reach, but we are just putting all, all our resources right now. The guys are on the rail 24 hours 7, and uh, yeah, it's going to be tight. For the returning fleet, Valletta's distinctive skyline is a welcome sight. In recent years, the Maltese capital has undergone an architectural renaissance. Architects have to lay down their ego a little bit when working in a city like this, and uh, fitting in is the most important. One thing that's also extremely important when dealing with um, such buildings is ensuring that the fabric is still respecting the whole street. The most striking of the city's new designs is the Parliament Building by world-renowned Italian architect Renzo Piano. They opted to have two different masses with a bridge connecting them, and I thought that really was important to change the scale of the building, so it was very nice, elegant design. It is a very unique city, and historically, it's, it's an amazing opportunity for, for any architect, and extremely challenging as well. Aragon completes the course after three days and 17 hours. Their endeavors are rewarded with a highly creditable sixth place in line honors, and second in IRC1. Behind the all-conquering Rambler. Nice one. Nice one. 
for sure it's the best result for our club, uh, best experience, best racing experience, sailing neck to neck four days with, with big boats, you know, they are amateurs so they are not professionals and they, they just tested themselves 100% and they are, they are winners today. Poland is one of 23 nations represented in this year's race, a reflection of the Royal Malta Yacht Club's enormous success in attracting international entries. Just eight yachts started the first event in 1968. This year's 40th edition sees 113 yachts entered, and the Marina di Valletta is now one of four yacht havens that accommodate the fleet. However, the prestige of being the first Maltese entry home remains a source of great local pride. This year, that honor goes to Lee Satariano and RT3. Rambler's tenure at the top of corrected time classification ends as stronger winds affect the contest. Be Wild takes full advantage of her ability in light air and then as the winds pick up, makes dramatic progress over the last 200 miles. The Italian entry crosses the finish line at 13.36 on the fifth day to take the lead by just over an hour. In qualsiasi caso abbiamo una grossa soddisfazione perché abbiamo fatto veramente una bella regata, non per peccare di presunzione, però tutto è andato molto molto bene. Expac's duel with Elusive is maintained all the way to the finish, with both yachts never more than a few miles apart. That's fantastic after 607 miles. It's been more or less a contact throughout our race. Now at the finish we will probably finish in an hour, within an hour of each other. As the wind increases, the turnovers come thick and fast. Elusive 2 leaves X-Pack behind. Aaron Meyer and Christoph Podesta's first 45 crosses the line at 1931 on day five. 66 minutes ahead of Camilleri's craft and inherits the overall lead. Within 50 minutes, Courier Recommendé also finishes with a time fast enough to take first place. However, Elusive are just one of a number of yachts requesting redress for lending assistance to a dismasted yacht, and the final results are likely to be recalculated. A fact Jerry Trontasso acknowledges with customary good grace. We will see, and uh, if we won, it's, it's very nice. If we finish the guns, it's very nice also. Elusive, the, the Elusive crew sell very well. Out on the course, JYS Jan are enjoying the upturning conditions. Finally, after four days of having zero to my point of win, we actually have a 17 out of it. On the final stretch to the finish in Valletta, the fleet passes St. Paul's Island. Christianity has almost 2,000 years of history in Malta, and according to tradition, was brought here by St. Paul the Apostle in around 60 AD. The maritime tradition linked to St. Paul is rooted in the story of his shipwreck on the islands. The story has him traveling from the Eastern Mediterranean, getting caught in a very big northeasterly storm, and Paul proceeds to spend a number of months on this island. St. Paul's Grotto, as it is known today, is believed to be a place where St. Paul lived and prayed. Most extraordinary of all is the impact that the story has on the maritime landscape. There are a number of chapels around the coast that are actually listed on sailing instructions. Ship graffiti, which are etched into the limestone, are probably dedications by seafarers paying their respects to the apostle for safe deliverance. When sailing past St. Paul's Bay, one cannot but notice the statue of St. Paul with his arms outstretched in thanksgiving facing out to sea. JYS Jan sails into harbor after close to six days at sea. The scratch crew has performed magnificently, 
finishing 47th out of 113 crafts on corrected time and 6th in their class. They become the first ever all-female crew to complete the race, an achievement to be celebrated. The Middle Sea Race with the Jam Foundation was um, an experience. Some pretty brutal sailing. We had lightning, we had rain. <laughs> we had, all. We had all the type of conditions you can expect during the Middle Sea Race. So we had the 35 knots, we had to drop the main. Um, a little bit stressful, but we, we survived. <laughs> They were amazing. You know, when you go offshore, you see the worst and the best parts of people. And I can tell you, I saw the best parts of every single one of these girls. And I'd never been on a yacht before. <laughs> so, learn, learn a lot, yeah. Following the final hearings for redress, Elusive 2 is confirmed the winner of the 2019 Rolex Middle Sea Race. For Aaron Christoph and Maya Podesta, this is a highly emotional moment. It's been a dream that actually almost, I feared that it would never actually come true. And now it's just all falling into place in the most magical way. When the trio started racing, it was with their father, Arthur, a legendary figure in the race's history, ever present from the inaugural event in 1968 until his untimely death in 2015. Arthur Podesta was a three-time winner, but never with his own boat. It is quite an emotional thing for us because we're here because he has led us here. We did all, all those races with him and um, we've had to sort of take over what he used to do. I think you could easily say that what we've done is thanks to him, but um, we, we continue to do it for him. In a race which required patience and persistence, and in conditions that veered from mentally sapping to the physically punishing, it was fitting that final glory should go to the crew of Elusive and the Podesta family, sailing an all Corinthian Maltese boat and part of the very fabric of the race since its creation 51 years ago. Next on Spirit of Yachting, we'll bring you all the action from the Rolex Sydney Hobart Yacht Race.